everyone, welcome to ATAR Notes lecture for chemistry, for prelim chemistry specifically. Um, all right, we'll just wait for one or two minutes before anyone else wants to join. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to, if you have any questions, um, pop into Slider and I'll be happy to answer them when I'm on my um, Q&A section. Um, and my name is Mahima, by the way. We'll just wait for maybe one or two minutes um, in case anyone else wants to join. All right, I think we'll get started. Just a quick bit about ATAR Notes. ATAR Notes pretty much helps to run, um, you know, free resources for students like the lecture you guys are watching um, and ensure that, you know, PhD students are able to overcome obstacles within their journey as well. And some of the free resources that we provide are things such as study notes, um, as well as lectures, um, calculator the HR calculator that we have as well as things just newsletters and the forum which is also pretty popular however if you are looking for more of a more tailored approach we do offer tutor smart which is pretty much like online tutoring for um our different hsc as well as the 11 subjects we also have um study guides with printed revision materials so you'll be able to find that on our bookshop um which I'll explore a bit more about later on. And then we also have Ed Unlimited, which is pretty much kind of like Netflix for um, studying, I guess, because you have all the different study guides for different subjects within one place as well. And in that sense, it's really useful. Um, but yeah, before I do um, hop on to um, the lecture. I just wanted to introduce myself as well. I'm Mahima. I graduated from Parramatta High School in 2021, which is two years ago. Um, I did bio, chem, extension to um, maths, as well as advanced English and French continuous. And currently I'm doing law and science at UTS and I teach chemistry, HSC chemistry in um, Chutesmont. So before we um, get on with the lecture I just wanted to jump onto slider I already see um people putting on questions which is great my first question is for you guys how are you feeling about entering year 11 so feel free to just you know press whatever you want um <laughs> nervous but looking forward to it i think yeah i think that was i had i had like a bunch of emotions when i was entering year 11 to be honest um but yeah i feel like you really start like getting into the meaty content which which i guess is like a good thing but also a scary thing um but yeah i think it will be exciting um it's also kind of like a little trial run before year 12 you really learn like you know how year 12 is going to be like in terms of load and you know what study techniques you have things like that so um yeah and yeah i think that's what i would say about year 11 and also it's okay if you know things don't go how you want it to be um because ultimately like i did so bad in year 11 and I turned out to be fine in year 12, so um, it's a journey and you should just take it as trial and error. But yeah, I'm glad that most people are looking forward to it. Um, it's okay if you're not as well. I understand it can be pretty scary. Um, but yeah, cool. Um, I don't know if you guys have already started looking at content, um, but I'll just still pop the question anyway. Is there anything you would like me to focus on? Um, this is more so just 
I mean, actually, no, this is not just for content. Um, this is also just for even if you want me to focus on study techniques, anything like that, um, just feel free to pop it in. Um, so no one has responded, which I don't know if I should take it as there's nothing that anyone wants me to focus on. Um, if you don't have anything in mind, you can also just say that. It's completely fine. Oh, okay. So a few people are typing. Okay, great. Content. Yes, there will be content. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, we do have a two and a half hour limit, so I can't cover everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, there will be like difficult concepts, yes, in a way. And also hard topics, like what's difficult for you may not be difficult for me. Depth studies. Um, I can't exactly cover content on depth studies. That's a bit vague because you know each school does their own thing but um you can always answer any questions you have about depth studies we'll just wait if anyone else wants to put is there assumed knowledge no no not really no um no even if you haven't really paid attention in year 10 let's say you can always go into year 11 with full focus and be fine um tips on understanding can uh important formulas fundamentals so today is pretty much just like the fundamentals um which is module one module one really sets the i guess first layer um for understanding chemistry but yeah All right, I think that is pretty much it. I'm going to close. Okay, someone asked mod two. Um, I can't exactly focus on mod two today because that's not what I initially wanted to cover. But um, if you have any questions in mod two, let me know. Um, all right, let's get into it. Um, okay. Let me just go on slideshow. Alrighty, first of all, welcome to Prelim Chem. Um, and, you know, it's going to be so exciting entering year 11, but also it's going to be pretty different into how, you know, year 10 science was structured. But this is really the year for you to, you know, just discover what your learning strategies are going to be like and how you want it to be like, as well as um, finalizing your um, Study, study strategies and your motivation and just experiment before you get to the HSC. Um, so don't be stressed if things don't go as planned. Not that, you know, it shouldn't. It should, but yeah. Um, pretty much what I'm going to be doing today is just looking a bit at what's chemistry, how do you study for chemistry, and then also just looking at module one as well as depth studies. In between, we'll also be doing um, questions. So what is chemistry? Um, chemistry is kind of like, I guess, a physical science, you could say. It pretty much just explores, you know, the structure, composition of um, things that exist within our world and the universe. Um, and you also have not only the theoretical side, but also the application of it, how we use chemistry in everyday life. You also explore this in um, year 12 as well. So it just keeps on going in that sense. Um, and it pretty much just explores like little building blocks of the universe, right? And that's pretty much your atoms and even more further on, like your protons, electrons, neutrons, etc. There's also one thing to note, the syllabus changed in 2019. Not that it concerns you guys because, you know, there's been a few rounds of the HSC with the new syllabus. So you have plenty of access to, um, past papers, 
But just one thing to note, if you're going to be using previous exams, just note that there's a um, greater focus on problem solving rather than memorizing. So you need to really understand and grapple the content rather than memorize the answers. Um, so in terms of the difference between prelim and HSC chem, um, I feel like Prelim Chem sets the foundations that you're going to be needing for HSC Chem. And if you do well in Prelim Chem, you'll be, you know, much more likely to be able to do well in HSC Chem. You don't need to, you know, spend your holidays revising over and over again for HS for Prelim Chem. Um, so make sure that you focus well. Um, at the same time, some concepts actually don't apply in HSC Chem when you're exploring it in Prelim Chem. Um, but everything that we're covering the lecture today is going to show up in HSC Chem, most likely. Um, and HSC Chemistry is also, I mean, since, it, you know, there is obviously a jump in content, um, just in terms of difficulty, but it's also, I find, much more interesting. So, yeah. And second question is HSC Chemistry more important than Braille Chem? Sort of, but that doesn't mean um, prelim chem is not important. Um, so, like I said, prelim chem really sets the foundations before you jump on to um, HSC chemistry. So, yeah. Um, and this is really the structure of prelim chem as well as HSC chem. You may be already aware of this. Um, prelim chem has four modules just like HSC, but... Um, the four modules explore properties and structure of matter. You, um, you get an introduction to quantitative chemistry, which is really the basis for the rest of these modules. Um, and then you also look at reactive chemistry. Um, some of it appears in year 12, some of it doesn't. And then you also have something called drivers of reactions. So that concept also does apply in year 12. So I feel like out of these three modules, the one that probably doesn't apply as much is module three, but that doesn't mean it's completely ignored. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And then the HSC chem, you look at equilibrium, um, you look at acid base reactions, you, you start going into organic chem, and you also have a module where you pretty much use all the knowledge in these three um, modules, and then you combine it in um, this module. But yeah, that's pretty much how the syllabus looks like. Um, and like I've already mentioned, um, you don't need to stress too much on prelim chem, but at the same time, like because HSC obviously counts your ATAR and year 11 doesn't, but you need a good foundation in prelim chem in order to do well in um, HSC chemistry. And the next question I guess you may all be having is how do you study for chemistry? Um, before launching into study, you actually need to know like, you know, what, what exactly is chemistry testing you on? You need to have good logical reasoning, good math skills, um, as well as succinct, um, clear language and focusing on your weaknesses is really important. So, um, the first thing that I would say is make your notes um, every week, be consistent with it. Um, if you make it every month, you're gonna be so overwhelmed by the end of it. It's just not gonna happen. So either be doing your notes every day or every week and also have practice questions because you never know when you're wrong until you've actually done it. Um, so yeah. And in just in terms of ensuring how to answer questions, you need to ensure that um, you have concise wording um, and that you're not just regurgitating what you've already memorized. It's more about explaining what you've um, learned. Um, and that's where, you know, like your resources come in, talk to your teacher. Um, some schools may have specific ways they want to do things. Um, my school definitely did. And um, yeah, I lost a few marks sometimes when I didn't get the wording that they wanted. Um, so yeah, just be aware of it. And um just, you know, send your teacher, like, um, different, you know, practice problems and just tell them to mark it because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are marking it for you. So, um, you know, feel, feel free to, um, you know, just send things to your, um, 
teacher or even your peers if you want to share with them or um, you know your tutors etc in terms of types of chem questions i feel like there's three main ones you have multiple choice um you also have short answer so that's like typically like a three or four marker and then you have a long response long response is when it's probably like six to eight marks and um yeah i feel like you tend to have to write it like a mini essay you need to have subheadings and things like that um and with the new syllabus uh short or mid-length response questions are also more common that doesn't mean that you don't see long response you definitely do um so yeah just know how to tackle all the three question types in terms of MCQ, it's typically straightforward. Um, it it wouldn't like test your knowledge too much. So it's probably gonna be something like a memorized fact or like simple data interpretation. But that being said, um, some of the hardest questions in HSC have been MCQ. So um, you have to be very careful with the detail in it. Um, and calculations can be sometimes harder than expected and time management is also really important. In terms of short answer questions, um, I feel like you just need to be straightforward, you know, ensure that you're um, defining key terms, including equations, and ensure that you have links between your answers as then you link one concept to the other because without that, um, you would be uh, losing marks. Um, so you just need to be succinct and concise and actually answer the question and be straightforward. In terms of the type of claim questions that you get, so in terms of um, long response, they're similar to kind of writing mini essays, like I said. So, but if you prepare for the topic, um, it shouldn't be too hard because really it's just, um, you know, providing key definitions and equations and then just having links throughout your response. And um, yeah, I feel like long response can go both ways. So in the sense that if you don't know much about the topic, but you know key definitions, you'll be getting marks, but it's easy to lose marks if you don't, um, if you're not logical or, a, or if like you're not having clear links in your answer. So in long response questions, it's really important that you um, subhead as well. So if we look at this question, this is a buffer question. You don't need to know what buffers are, by the way, this is year 12. Um, but if you look at like a buffer, a buffer is pretty much something that doesn't change in pH. So you would define the key concepts relating to it, which is Le Chatelier's principle. Um, and you'd explain Le Chatelier's principle. And you would also um, further on, you know, provide an example of a buffer and explain what happens in a buffer. Um, and you would also, in this case of a buffer, explain what happens when um, another reactant is added. So that's, how, that's kind of how you structure it. Um, we do have practice questions today in this lecture. So um, you will be having a go at those as well. So feel free to um, ask me any questions. All right, let's go through um, pretty much a breakdown of module one. There is, it's core properties and structure of matter. Pretty much the intro to year 11 chemistry. Um, and overall, this module is um, pretty important because it helps you to understand how chemistry operates and um, both the syllabus and your curriculum in this case are just your best friends, not only just for this module, but also um, throughout your HSC. So make sure you prepare your notes according to the syllabus that they ask. Um, and in terms of module one, um, the main things is just looking at, you know, what matter is, what it looks like, how substances can be separated or how can they, um, how do they stay, um, together. And that's like in terms of bonding. And you also look at how the periodic table structured and their, and their, um, transit patterns that are with it. So that's really what 
module one is. Um, and that pretty much just explains that you look at mixtures, you look at periodic table, like I said, you also look a bit at atomic theory, um, all of which we'll be looking at today. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So there's properties of matter, there's bonding, there's atomic structure and atomic mass, as well as periodicity, which is pretty much um, trends within the periodic table. So um, in terms of properties of matter, um, you pretty much explore homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures through practical investigation. You use nomenclature of inorganic substances. Um, you don't do organic in year 11. Um, and then you also look at elements based on their properties and position within the periodic table. If you're asking what a homogeneous or a heterogeneous mixture is, a homogeneous mixture is pretty much just where you have uniform composition. Heterogeneous means it has various compositions throughout um, the mixture. So this dot point pretty much tells you how to separate um, mixtures and categorize them. In terms of looking at matter overall we've only looked at mixtures but matter also comprises of pure substances if we want to define matter it's pretty much anything in space um mixtures are pretty much when you have two or more substances present i guess or bonded together um and pure substances is when you have um only one type of an atom or a molecule and those are things such as elements or compounds um and you can see the difference that is that elements is just a type of atom, can't be broken down further. Compounds are two or more elements bonded together, but they can be broken down. Mixtures are two or more substances um, bonded together. So that's the difference between all of these different kinds. And if we were to provide examples of heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures, Heterogeneous mixtures may be things like blood because blood has different components to it. Um, in regular examples, it might be cereal and milk, whereas homogeneous mixtures might be something like air where particles are distributed uniformly or something like rain or vodka. Um, so yeah, that pretty much just helps distinguish um, what heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures are. Um, in terms of physical and chemical properties between um, different compounds or just like overall, physical properties is when you can um, have a change but it won't affect the chemical formula or composition of the substance. Um, chemical properties is when there's a change that can't be reversed really and um, it will pretty much just change the substance overall, just in terms of its chemical formula. So physical properties include color, density, luster, or shape. Chemical properties can include something like whether it's acidic, basic, or neutral, how it reacts with another substance like water. And the question that I am giving you guys now is whether boiling point is a physical or a chemical property. And I will pop that on to the slider um and you guys can answer this i will quickly get some water so i'll be right back Okay, I'm back. Um, so 
if we look at the answers, everyone's saying physical property. You're right. Um, the reason why it's physical is because um, changing the boiling point won't affect the chemical formula of um, the substance, right? Like all it's doing is just changing in state. So that's why it's a physical property. All right. Um, in terms of module one, we also look at various separation techniques. Um, the main ones are things such as filtration, evaporation, and chromatography, but it's not as common. Um, and these are pretty much physical methods of separation, and they rely on the differences of physical properties. Um, in terms of what filtration is, filtration is pretty much where you have a mixture being passed through a filter and whatever comes out of um, like whatever passes through pretty much is called the filtrate and the remainder is called a residue. So this relies on either solubility or your particle size because there is two types of separate filtration, sorry. Um, filtration can also be something like sieving. So that's when you have like, let's say a bunch of rocks of different sizes and you sieve it through. And what happens is that smaller rocks go to the bottom, bigger rocks stay at the top. Um, and in terms of solubility, you may have something that is insoluble. So let's say something like um, lead chloride and it's in water and you have to separate the lead chloride from the water. You would then use filter paper, pour the mixture and what will happen is that the lead chloride will be at the top of the filter paper and the water will just pass through. Evaporation has two different types. Um, like it kind of branches off pretty much. You have crit crystallization and distillation. Um, crystallization is pretty much where you have a mixture being heated up and it cools down. Um, and when the solution cools down, the liquid pretty much evaporates and you have crystals being formed. And you can see um, different kinds of crystals that are formed. Like, so for example, um, magnesium sulfate forms crystals um, and sodium chloride forms crystals as well. It's really cool. Um, and then you also have distillation. Distillation is where you have two liquids and you separate them according to boiling point. So, Let's say I have, um, it's a hard one. Um, let's say I have water and then probably maybe, um, another solution. So for example, I'm just trying to think of a solution that we may use. Um, something like hydrochloric acid. Um, in that case, it's likely that the water might may have a higher boiling point, so therefore that will um, evaporate later. So that's how you kind of separate it in terms of distillation. You also have other techniques called decanting and centrifuging. Centrifugation, sorry. Um, decanting pretty much relies on gravity. So that's where you have, um, you know, the density being involved. That's a physical property. Um, and pretty much the lighter liquid that has a lower density float to the top, the heavier liquid, the more dense liquid is at the bottom, and you just pour the lighter liquid out first, and then you've separated the two layers. Centrifugation is where you have centrifugal force being used, and you separate components according to um, either their size, shape, or density. So um, it depends. For example, blood can also be centrifuged. So what happens is that when you um, put blood in a centrifuge and it spins, um, you can separate the blood according to the plasma, the white blood cells, the red blood cells, things like that. Um, I don't know how, I don't know the density of those, but that's how you kind of separate blood when you need something like plasma. Um, and these are pretty much the setups of um, each technique. So this one's filtration. Like I said, you have filter paper and you can use a funnel and Filtrate is being collected here. This is evaporation. Um, evaporation is pretty straightforward. I'm sure we've all seen it. Um, you just use a Bunsen burner or a heating mat, whatever you want to use. Um, not a heating mat, sorry, a heating, uh, not a heating plate, a hot plate. Um, 
or you can also distill things. So like I said, that's through um, boiling point and you use something called a condenser and you have water being used as well because water helps to cool down the condenser as well as the liquid is passing through. And this is also what a centrifuge looks like. In um, year 11, you may be asked to calculate percentage composition. So percentage composition is pretty much like the mass of the element that you have over the total mass of the compound um, and you times it by 100 um, because it's a percentage. Um, and the most common mistake with this is that you have different units for both your denominator and numerator. Um, and this just pretty much just shows like the ratio, like how much of a particular element is within um, that substance. All right, now I have a quick question for you guys. I think I did put this up on Slido. So let me pull it up. Have a go at this question. Okay, most people are saying 2%, some people are saying 20, or 20,000. Um, some more people are typing, so we'll let them finish it off. All right, um, so remember how I said we need the same units? Um, so in that case, if you have 50 grams and you got 2.5 kilograms, if you do 50 over 2.5, you get a value larger than um, uh, 100, obviously. Um, sorry, no, you won't get a value larger than 100. Um, what will happen is that you won't get the correct percentage. Um, you just have to keep it the same unit. So you can either convert this into kilograms or you can change this into grams. Um, in this case, we've just converted everything into grams. So it'll just be 50 grams over 2,500 grams times by 100, and you get 2% as your final value. Um, and that's how it pretty much works. So that's how composition, percentage composition is like. It's pretty straightforward. Just to make sure that you're not making the common errors. Um, and I've pretty much explored physical or chemical properties of matter. Um, the next like section of that, I guess, inquiry question is also how it looks like in the periodic table. And I'm also combining it with um, the third inquiry question of periodicity. So, and that's pretty much just asking, you know, what are the patterns in your periodic table? Um, for those who may think that you can, you know, I feel like try memorizing the periodic table. You don't need to memorize the entire one. You're given it to it in the exam. Um, it's not worth it. Um, and if you're never given a periodic table, ask for one because you're meant to be given one anyways. Um, and I feel like for the periodic table, all you need to do is just know where things are in terms of the elements. Um, and in terms of using the periodic table, they may look confusing, complex, and even annoying, but they're actually really, really useful. Um, and you pretty much need them to do the calculations anyway. Um, so yeah, they're really important. If we just break down on how we read periodic tables, um, oh no. 
um, we always start off with, I mean, there's like a few, a few different elements. You have your, um, you know, like written representation or the name. Um, and you also have a symbol to represent it for carbon at C. So pretty straightforward. Um, sometimes, um, for example, like sodium doesn't have S, it has NA because um, that comes, I think, from its Latin name, natrium. So you may also see the Latin, um, I guess, like symbol as well. Um, and you also have something called an atomic number at the top over here that's above the symbol. And this is pretty much the amount of protons that is in the nucleus. And then you also have something called the relative atomic mass over here. So that's pretty much the mass of the um, nucleus that you have in your um, specific atom. And a nucleus contains both protons and um, neutrons. Sometimes the name isn't included, unfortunately. So just um, you just kind of got to know what is what. Um, but if we look at um, the, oh no, not chemist warehouse. Um, if I look at the um, periodic table that we have over here, if I just rotate this, um, this is the HSC periodic table. Um, they've given you the names, which is good um, as well. So if you ever forget what you know the symbol stands for, you can always look at the name underneath. So I recommend that you just print this out and have this next to you whenever you're doing um, practice problems because you want to get familiarized with what, you know, this periodic table shows you. So let's go back to our slideshow. And the periodic table pretty much looks like this. Um, technically you have 18 groups. We mainly only look at, um, these ones over here, not anything from four to 12 over here because they're really just transition metals um, and they tend to have varying charges. So it's not really good for predicting trends. And these are lanthanoids and actinoids. You don't really encounter these ones except really uranium maybe. Um, but for the rest, you kind of just have to know what is what, I guess. So for example, um, these are your alkali metals and these are your alkaline earth metals. Um, you have your transition metals over here. You also have a bunch of other metals over here. They're not really categorized. Um, and these are your non-metals. But if we want to further specify what they are, this group, group seven, is halogens. And this is group eight, which is your noble gases. Noble gases um, are stable. They don't react with anything. Um, and yeah, you don't really need to worry about whatever I'm crossing out over here. Um, but for the rest, you need to know these by heart. You've got to know the charges, what they are, um, where you can kind of find them on the periodic table. Don't bother about memorizing the atomic mass or anything like that. They'll usually give it to you, um, in the periodic table anyways. Overall, in terms of what the periodic table are, Groups over here are the vertical columns and periods over here are um, your horizontal, I guess, like um, rows that you see over here. Groups tend to have similar characteristics. Rows don't, um, or periods don't, sorry. Um, groups tend to be characterized by their charges. So these have a plus one charge. This is plus two, plus three, plus four minus three, minus two, minus one, and zero as a charge. That's how you kind of structure it. Um, and that's how you kind of know um, what they're representing. And the main ones that we're really concerned about is alkali or alkali um, earth metals, transition metals, halogens, and noble gases. Metals in terms of their characteristics tend to be shiny, ductile, malleable. They have a good melting and boiling point. Metalloids have similar characteristics of both metals and non-metals um, and gases, which are typically non-metals anyways, um, 
they are dull sometimes you're not being able to see a color you may be seeing a color for gases um, and they have a lower melting and boiling point and they do not conduct um, heat or electricity that well for the rest of them you have alkali and alkali earth metals um, these tend to be really soft and um, highly reactive um, halogens tend to um, exist in pairs and noble gases are single atoms they are um, colorless and they don't really react with anything and transition metals everything's different um, they just have different properties so it just depends on the element that you have over there all right the next section is pretty much just going to explore what atomic structure looks like so let's further look at what an atom really comprises of um, I did mention a bit about protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, the atom pretty much has these three subatomic particles. Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Electrons surround the nucleus. Um, and protons and neutrons have a relative mass of one, whereas electrons don't really have a mass. Um, you can just call it negligible. Protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have a neutral charge. And electrons have a negative charge um and yeah that's pretty much it if you look at a nucleus not a nucleus sorry if you look at an atom this is what it will look like you'll have your nucleus over here and then something called shells um that pretty much surround the nucleus with electrons in it however um there can be kind of different variations of a particular element and that's pretty much something called isotopes we also something we also look at something called radioisotopes which are pretty much unstable isotopes that emit radioactive energy so let's move on in terms of isotopes isotopes pretty much are different forms of an element the only difference is that they contain different numbers of neutrons within the nucleus however they have the same chemical properties because chemical properties is determined by electrons. It's not determined by the nucleus. But since there is a different amount of neutrons you have, you have different physical properties. So things such as mass, because you have um, a varying mass now. Um, and if you're having an unstable isotope, then it will undergo radioactive decay and emit radiation. So, if we look at the nucleus, or not, sorry, not nucleus, if we look at the atom over here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons, um, and six neutrons and six protons. So that is pretty much carbon. And you would just think that all carbon atoms exist like this, right? But no, that's not exactly the case. Um, what happens is that you have different um, isotopes being present of carbon, one of them being carbon-12, so you have six protons and six neutrons. For carbon-13, you have one extra neutron, um, and that makes it carbon-13. And then for carbon-14, you have two more neutrons within the nucleus, and we just named that carbon-14. Note, however, the only thing is changing is the neutrons. It's um, not changing the number of protons or the number of electrons. So in isotopes, remember that only thing that changes is the amount of neutrons that you have within your nucleus. And really, in reality, what we do is that we combine all the different isotopes, their masses and their percentages, to create the relative atomic mass that we have. Um, and remember that in a sample of carbon, we don't just have, um, you know, all of it just being carbon 12. Most of it, which is around 98.89% is carbon 12, and a bit of it is carbon 13. In order to represent iso isotopes, this is how we kind of, I guess, like do it in terms of chemistry um we have the symbolic um representation so the symbol um as well as your mass number and your atomic number mass number is protons and neutrons the numbers of it and then atomic number is only how many protons you have 
So you do mass number at the top and an atomic number at the bottom. Radioisotopes, however, um, are unstable, which I have explored. Um, and in radioisotopes, you will get different kinds of radiation occurring. Um, there's three types. The, so there's alpha, beta, and gamma decay or radiation. Alpha decay is when you have, um, it's really occurring in heavy um, isotopes. So it really just wants to chuck all of its nucleons away. So like um, it's protons and electrons, not protons and electrons, sorry. Protons and neutrons away. Um, and alpha decay is characterized by um, a helium nucleus. So if we look at the periodic table over here, where is helium? Helium is over here. Atomic number is two. And typically you'd have, therefore you'd have two protons and two neutrons. And therefore um, that's what's happening over here. You're really emitting a helium nucleus and the ionizing power is pretty high. Um, and however, the penetrating power is pretty low, meaning it can't really pass through um, certain objects so it can be stopped by a sheet of paper. For beta decay, um, this occurs when you have too many neutrons. Um, and in this case, what happens is that an electron is being um, emitted. Um, and that's why you have um, negative one as a charge over here. And this can be stopped by an aluminium plate. Aluminium has the wrong spelling. I just realized that. And then gamma radiation um, does not have like really any charge or mass um, because it's energy, right? It's a kind of wave. So this is when you have excess energy. So it just removes the energy through gamma radiation. Ionizing power is low, but it's it's really easy to um, like penetrate through different um, objects. Um, and it can only be stopped by a lead plate that's several centimeters thick. So actually what happens is that I think when you want to treat your produce, your food, um, for, you know, any, um, I guess, like, uh, contamination that, that there may be. So, I don't know, bacteria, you use gamma radiation for that um, because it pretty much kills organisms at that point when it passes through. And, yeah, it's pretty damaging. Um, but, yeah, these are the three kinds of radiation that you need to know, and you also kind of need to know like where it kind of occurs and why it occurs. If we further look on as to how, you know, it's structured in terms of an equation, this is how you would kind of represent it. So let's say you have a specific isotope decaying for alpha decay. Um, it produces a helium nucleus, right? And a helium nucleus has two protons, two neutrons and you know atomic number being two protons so therefore this top number will decrease by four so therefore it'll be a minus four and then um the what is it called atomic number decreases by two so therefore it'll be z minus two um if we were to apply this in a real life real life scenario so let's say um i have uh um, let's say oxygen, right? Um, or even carbon, let's take carbon. Um, if I have carbon, so therefore I have, um, 12 over here and then six over here. Um, what's going to happen is that 12 minus four will be eight on the top over here. And therefore, um, the bottom one will also have a change. You have um, six minus two becoming four. So therefore it'll be eight, four. Um, and then you just need to figure out what element has a atomic number of four. And in this case is it's beryllium, right? So it'll go from carbon 12, six to helium four, two plus beryllium eight, four. So that's how, that's how you kind of structure it. Hopefully that makes sense. For beta decay, um, since it's actually an electron um, being removed, this top number does not change when you write it down in the equation. Um, but in this case, um, 
what happens is that the bottom number gets added by one because remember z plus one minus one is z so that's why we're doing it as z plus one and really what happens is that a neutron converts itself into a proton and an electron that's why you have atomic number increasing by one so that's the theory behind it in terms of gamma radiation there's no change um it just releases energy so there's no change in atomic of mass number Um, and this is a case study of radioisotopes over here. If we further move on in terms of energy levels within um, atomic structure and atomic mass, um, you know that you know you have a nucleus and you have um, electron shells surrounding it. Um, and they have electrons and this is pretty much something called the Bohr model the shell model is typically the Bohr model and you were probably introduced to this in um year 10. i remember i was so i definitely remember it um and the Bohr model really just tells you how atoms not sorry not atoms electrons work when they're excited or when they're not excited um and that's called emission spectra so Bohr kind of explains um electron shells as levels of kind of fixed energy um and you know Bohr pretty much says that if they're excited they go from a lower energy level to a higher energy level and when they do that they're absorbing energy and then once they're excited they immediately return to their original ground state and when they return they're releasing energy that they absorbed um and that's in the form of light and when you have this light being picked up by a specific um, emission spectrum machine, um, it can then be processed and you can kind of interpret what the kind of atom is because different atoms, you know, di emit different wavelengths of light. So that's pretty much how um, emission spectra works. So lower energy levels are close to the nucleus, higher energy levels tend to go um, further beyond in terms of the Bohr model. And if there's an electron, um, it would go from ground state and then have so much energy and go to the next energy level. So this would be the excited state. Um, and each um, shell holds a max number of electrons shell one holds only two electrons shell two holds eight shell three holds 18 fourth is 32 and by the time you get to the nth one it will be 2n squared so that's the pattern over here um but often than not like i know that third shell can hold 18 but that doesn't mean it's just gonna chuck all of its electrons um if let's say there's 18 electrons all of it wouldn't just go to the third shell um Often what it does is that it likes to have eight and then just go to the next shell and then you know, fill it up that way. Um, that's just how it works because it doesn't want to overcrowd itself. Um, so that's pretty much Bohr's model. But um, Bohr's model is actually not the model that we really look at in year 11 anymore. We look at something completely different and that's called schrodinger's model um and the reason why we're pretty much cancelling Bohr's model is because it doesn't really um explain how it works um like in terms of an emission spectra it only explains the hydrogen atom it doesn't explain other atoms um and it's also outdated in terms of how um our atoms work so no more Bohr model um we look at schrodinger's model so Schrodinger kind of improved on Bohr's model. He pretty much says that instead of being fixed shells, he calls um, electrons, I guess like the place where electrons are, as clouds. So Schrodinger is saying this is how the atom looks like. Um, and instead of, um, you know, not only being in shells, there's also going to be smaller regions of space called orbitals. 
So I'll get to that. And electrons are also considered to have wave-like properties in um, Schrodinger's model. So that's also one more difference from Bohr's model. Schrodinger's model includes three levels of categorization for um, electrons. You have a shell, oh no. Um, you have a shell being the largest one, then comes a subshell, and then comes an orbital. Um, for shells, you just label it by numbers. For subshells, you have four different subshells. So you have S, B, D, F, and S being the lowest energy level, F being the highest subshell, and then orbitals um, within subshells, and each orbital only holds two electrons. So that's how it's categorized. And if I want to represent how um, the different um, like shells, subshells look like, this is a nice way to represent the different energy levels. So um, each of these represent a different subshell and how they are in terms of um, their organization. Um, so 1s has a lower energy level than 2s. Um, and then it goes to 2p, and then 3s, and then 3p, 4s, and so forth. So if you follow this um, pattern, you'll be able to um, figure out the ordering of um, subshells. And yeah, SPDF notation, which is also something you're going to have to do within um, this, I guess, like course, um it tends to be the hardest topic for me at least like I found it really hard um throughout module one so if you're finding like this content difficult don't worry um because I found it really hard as well um but I I just thought I'd rather include the difficult concepts as well so that's kind of how SPDF notation works um if we're going to look further into SPDF notation, so that's pretty much how do we represent, you know, these electrons in an atom um, through S, like through Schrodinger's model, and that's what that's why we use SPDF notation. We can use something called um, the box notation. So if you see over here, um, the box notation pretty much contains several different boxes that represent um, the different um, electrons. So let's say um, someone asks you to write down the box notation for aluminium, right? Um, we go to the periodic table firstly, and we look at what is the atomic number of aluminium? Atomic number of aluminium is 13. So therefore, if you have 13 protons, you're going to have 13 electrons because ideally in a nucleus, not in an equal, sorry, in an atom, everything is going to be equal, ideally. Um, so we're going to say that it has 13 electrons, right? So what happens here is that you just have to represent each arrow as an electron. So you can see here that in box notation, um, you pretty much have the different subshells, right? You have 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, and 3p. Um, and you pretty much just keep on filling these shells up, sub, not subshells, sorry. You keep on filling these orbitals up, so these boxes up, until you reach whatever subshell you're reaching. Um, and you can see over here um, that Within the different um, subshells, you have a different set of boxes. That's because there's a set amount of electrons that each subshell can hold. Um, so the first subshell, so 1s, can only hold two electrons. That's why you have one box. 2s is also the lowest energy level. It can only hold two electrons. 2p can hold six electrons. 3p can also hold six electrons. That's how you kind of represent it. Um, and then for D and F, um, it can hold 10 electrons and 14 electrons. So therefore, in terms of the boxes, because it has um, 
two electrons in each box, so each orbital. Um, that's why we're representing it like this. You can also see that um, the different um, like way it's oriented in terms of the arrows, um, and that's also because of something called spin. Spin is a concept, I guess, to learn a bit about it in physics from my memory. Um, it just represents how electrons are. Um, so that's why we're just doing one arrow as up and one arrow as down. That's due to the spin state, but you don't need to worry about that. So this is how you represent um, um, electrons of aluminium according to the different subshells. Hopefully that um, makes sense. So you just keep on filling it up until you reach um, 3P. With that being said, um, I'll just let you guys quickly take a picture of this just so you have an idea of it and you can um, write down each of it. Um, so I'll just go back. Now we'll just pump a few questions out and we'll do it together. So I'll do the first one with you guys um, and then you guys can have a go at the second one. Um, all right, I can't exactly draw um, electron configuration. I mean, I can try, but yeah. Let's start off with um, carbon over here. So it's asking, write the electron configuration of carbon using SVDF um, notation. So if we look at our periodic table, we first locate where carbon is. Carbon is number six over here. So we know that we have six electrons of carbon and we need to use this, um, you know, the, the subshells and all to write down the SPDF notation. So when writing down SPDF notation, we always start off with the lowest energy level. Remember, electrons like to be stable. They don't like being in high energy levels. So you always go with the lowest one first. All right, so we know we have um, six electrons over here um, and we start off with 1s. So therefore you will write SBGF notation as 1s. And you need to tell um, in the SBGF notation how many electrons are in the 1s subshell. It can hold two electrons, we've got six electrons, so we'll just fill the um, subshell up. So therefore we'll write it as one S squared. So we fill two electrons, you go to the next energy level. In this, you can see here that the next energy level is two S. So therefore um, you write it as two S and you can um, fill up two more electrons within the 2s subshell. So therefore we write it as 1s squared and then 2s squared. We have two more electrons remaining. So if we keep on following this pathway, we go to the next energy level being 2p. Um, you can see here that um, 2p has uh, a lower energy level than 3s. So um, just be aware of that. Um, so you wouldn't automatically jump to 3s, you would go to 2p. Hopefully that makes sense. So therefore you write it as 1s squared, 2s squared, and then 2p squared. Use the numbers over here at the top to figure out how many electrons you've written totally. Um, so therefore it's 2 plus 2 plus 2, and that's 6. So this is the SVDF notation of carbon. If I'm going to write down the um, box notation, which is pretty much like this, um, I think I just need to get up um, my annotation. Okay, I don't think it's working. Um, but you pretty much use this to write down the box notation. So if I go to um, the box notation over here, you can see here that 1s and 2s is being filled up but in different arrow directions because of spin state like I mentioned and 2p is being filled up like this. 
Um, you may be wondering why 2P is being filled up like this instead of being filled up as one up over here and one down over here. That's because of um, another law that comes into play. Um, that's because of Hun's rule. Hun's rule pretty much states that each orbital subshell must be filled up before you, you know, put more electrons into it. So that's why we're trying to fill up each of them as much as we can. We can't fill up this one because we don't have enough electrons for it. So that's how you write down electron configuration. Um, you guys can now have a go at um, the electron configuration of silicon. I'll just wait if anyone else wants to type in the answer. Um, all right. Um, most people got the correct answer um this is like the shortened version i think um yeah i don't really recommend doing it this way um i know what you're hinting at you're looking at um any over here and then where's silicon silicon's over here but don't do that um at least i don't think that's what your teachers are expecting um the people who said uh, 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p6, 3s squared, 3p squared, that's correct. 3s4 doesn't exist because the s subshell can only hold two electrons. Um, for those who said 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p squared, no. So, typically, like, the p subshell can hold, like, six electrons. Um, so why would it be holding only two electrons? Because remember how, according to Hans' rule, you want everything to be filled up. Um, so it wouldn't exist as 2p squared. Um, I'll explain a bit once I do the box notation. So this is the notation, right? Um, if we look at the box notation, um, remember um, the S subshell has one orbital, P subshell has three orbitals, 
piece of trust three orbitals so that's fine um it's one s squared so therefore the s subshell is filled up over here so it's just one up one down and then next one's two s squared also filled up so therefore it's just one up and one down 2p squared 6 is all filled up the way you fill it up is you put one arrow going up in each of these boxes you have according to han's rule which i've um, referred over here you need to pretty much fill it up um so therefore you've done three up therefore you do three down just to fill it up because you can and then you've got um four more electrons remaining so therefore you go to the next subshell the lowest one which is 3s so you just fill that up again and then you go to 3p 3p won't just be one up one down in this little box remember you want to fill up all the little sub not the subshell sorry all the little orbitals you can so therefore um it'll just be um two electrons this way going up so that's how you kind of represent it so yeah that's um pretty much how you explain it and that relates to Hun's rule um due to electron electron repulsion you don't want repulsion you want to have lower energy levels so that's why we do it this way so yeah hopefully that um makes sense um i'm just gonna stop the poll over here um the next half is pretty much looking a bit at bonding a bit more at um properties of um atoms within the periodic table um and in terms of bonding we look at ionic compounds as well as covalent compounds um and this relates to a concept called electronegativity electronegativity relates to the tendency of an atom to um attract electrons um and fluorine is the most electronegative element in the periodic table you just go ahead and know that um and a difference in electronegativity can determine whether the bond is ionic or covalent typically if you have um i think if it's, if you have a larger difference in electronegativity it's ionic because um ionic bonds are pretty much having both metal and a non-metal and if you look at um electronegativity in the periodic table um electronegativity increases as you go towards the right so so as you go um, across a um, period so therefore if you have something like sodium and chlorine both of which are on opposite sides sodium being not so electronegative and chlorine being very electronegative you actually have an ionic bond being formed because there's that large difference um and that's pretty much ionic bonding if you have a smaller difference in um, electronegativity so let's say um it's between let's say actually we're doing um i'm just trying to think of a compound um this shouldn't be this hard um let's say no2 right nitrogen and oxygen are next to each other so they have really similar different not really similar differences they have similar electronegativity so therefore um they will form something called covalent bonds ionic bonds are also the transfer of electrons from metal to non-metal because um non-metals like to um accept electrons metals like to donate electrons um and you have a smaller difference in electronegativity for covalent bonds um and this is pretty much where you share electrons and adding on to ionic compounds um you can define the bonding as electrostatic attractions between a cation and an anion so a cation is something that is positively charged and anion is something that is negatively charged and you can see that over here um if we look at um nacl over here you have a sodium um iron and a chlorine um iron and you can see here that there is one extra electron over here in the sodium ion and what happens is that um the sodium gives the electron to chlorine and therefore you form an ionic bond and that is how you form sodium chloride and you can see here that it's accepted that electron like i said covalent compounds have um 
shared electrons um, and specifically the valency electrons. So the valency electrons are electrons that are in the outer shell. The only thing that matters in bonding is the valency electrons, not these ones in the um, inner shells. So just make sure you're aware of that. Um, and because they are pretty similar in terms of where they're located in the periodic table, they tend to have a lower electronegativity difference. So yeah, and you can see here that um, the electronegativity difference tends to be like 0 0.5 or 1.7, and then for ionic, um, it's greater than 1.7 because of, you know, you're having both a metal and a non-metal, whereas here it's two different non-metals. Um, and Adding on, covalent bonds can be polar or non-polar. So I will also explain that later on. Module one um, has a bunch of different stuff, but I feel like the most important section is probably this one because this really, like understanding this is really going to help you in year 12. So make sure you're, I guess, thoroughly um, prepared across this topic. Um, bonding, the bonding that we've seen so far, so, um, ionic and covalent are something called intramolecular forces. These are forces between, sorry, not between, within molecules. So between, um, two different atoms. Intermolecular forces is when you have interactions between two different molecules. So let's say two different molecules of water. That's the kind of interaction that we're talking about. It's, it's really important that you know the difference. Um, so examples of the forces are things such as covalent bonds, which I've explored, and then ionic bonds. Intermolecular has three kinds of forces. These forces tend to be tested more often than ionic because these really um, can like be tested in really different ways in the exam. So there's three kinds. Um, you have dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen. Dispersion forces are the weakest, followed by dipole, dipole, and then hydrogen bond is the strongest. So this increases in terms of strength, if that makes sense. Um, dispersion forces um, occur in all molecules, all compounds and substances. So if they ever ask you what intermolecular forces um, will this compound have, you will immediately need to write dispersion. Dipole-dipole bonds um, occur um, in polar molecules, um, and I'll explain what polarity is. Um, and hydrogen bonds is the strongest intermolecular force, um, and that only occurs between a few sets of um, molecules. Um, I think I do explore that later on i'm just quickly checking because if i don't it's gonna be a mess okay i don't so let me further um explain it all right um i haven't written this down so just note it down as i'm explaining hydrogen bonds occur between a hydrogen atom and oxygen fluorine or nitrogen atom make sure you note that down if you don't ask me um through slider um and dipole dipole bonds only occur in polar compounds and hydrogen bonds also occur only in polar compounds so note that down all right um another set of bonding is also looking at physical properties and that's also called allotropy so allotropy pretty much explores different um, chemical structures of atoms as well as elements. Um, and that's pretty much where it ap appears in different forms. So you have um, allotropes of different substances. The main ones that we really focus on in E11 chem is carbon and silicon. Um, carbon's probably the more common one. Um, so allotropes of carbon include graphite and diamond. These have different um, bonding so therefore they're going to have different physical properties um in terms of structure of diamond it has a complex network and then for graphite um it's pretty much like sheets 
but they're connected to one another sort of so therefore it's like weaker bonding than diamond and therefore it can be easily disturbed that's why graphite is softer and diamond is very hard and if you you know put pressure it's going to break it's brittle um so yeah um and due to the structure sorry not Diamond's not brittle. Graphite is brittle. I think I'm just confusing it around. Diamond has a pretty solid structure. It, it's like a network over here. Um, and therefore, it's pretty hard to break. Graphite's not really connected. So therefore, it's brittle. That's why you can, um, you know, if you use pencils, you can see that if you put enough pressure, that graphite will slowly start to crumble. Um, that's because of its weakened bonding. Diamond, on the other hand, um, if you put a lot of pressure only if you put a lot of pressure will it break, otherwise it won't. Um, and obviously it's used in jewellery. Um, you also have other kinds of networks. So we look at um, ionic and covalent networks as well as metallic, metallic structures. Um, ionic networks are pretty much lattices that you see in ionic compounds. So what happens is that you have you know, cations and anions, and it just alternates throughout the grid. So in, let's say, a sodium um, crystal, what it looks like is actually as a network. So you have sodium and chlorine ions just repeating, and it's held by ionic bonds, obviously. Because ionic bonds are so strong, and note that intramolecular forces are stronger than intermolecular forces, um, is going to have high melting and boiling points, um, but it can't conduct electricity when it's at a lattice because you're sharing um, electrons. There's no free electrons floating around. And without free electrons floating around, um, you're not ever going to conduct electricity. So that's why ionic networks only conduct electricity when they're in a liquid state, not when they're in a solid state. So like as a crystal. Um, and they're also brittle because when you hit by a force, um, the ions that have the same charge pretty much repel against each other and that just breaks the lattice. So that's why they are brittle. Again, if you're not understanding this, let me know and I can re-explain this. Um, and yeah, this is what the lattice looks like. Covalent networks um, are pretty much lattices but with non-metals. So they have a bonding called continuous covalent bonding. Um, and covalent networks are pretty strong, so therefore they have a high melting and boiling point, but they don't conduct electricity because in a covalent bond, you're literally sharing electrons. There's no electrons just roaming around, so therefore you can't conduct electricity. And if you don't know what electricity is, electricity is just pretty much just a current of electrons. That's all it is. Um, so without electrons, no electricity in essence. Um, and an example of a covalent network is diamond because diamond is pretty much just carbon um, atoms joined together like this. You also have something called covalent molecular. So in this case, you have a weaker covalent bonding. So as a result of the weaker bonding, it's pretty malleable. You can um, allow it to move. Like for example, graphite is an example of covalent molecular because it has that weak bonding um, it's not going to, um, be as strong and it's going to be able to move because they can just slide over each other. Um, so yeah, and it's not really, um, very strong either. It doesn't conduct electricity either. However, if it is an aqueous solution and it goes into its ions, then it can conduct electricity. And an example of that is HCl. Um, so HCl pretty much associates into H plus and Cl minus. When they are ions, what happens is that um, the cation, which has more electrons, will just give away its electrons in um, solution um, to the chlorine. And um, when it's doing that, you have just free electrons roaming around in that solution. So therefore, it can conduct electricity. Um, and an example of covalent molecular is also ice. You also have um, metallic structure. So metallic structures are a bit weird. Um, I don't know if I'm just going to... Do I have an example of metallic structure? No. I can show you what the metallic... 
metallic bonding model looks like. Um, it's pretty useful just to look at it. So this is pretty much what um, a metal would look like. Um, so you just have cation surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. So that's what the metallic bonding model is. And since it's delocalized, meaning that, you know, the atoms aren't just holding onto the electrons themselves, um, they're pretty much floating around and it can, can dot, uh, conduct electricity. Um, and all of these ions are held together by a strong electrostatic attraction. Um, and like I said, it can conduct electricity. It's also malleable and ductile. Since you have these free floating electrons, even if you put pressure on it, it can just adjust itself um, and bond with the ions again. Um, and because they have such strong attractions, you have high melting and boiling points. However, one thing to note is that the metallic bondle, bonding model cannot explain things such as magnetic nature of certain metals like iron, the differences in conductivity, as well as the differences in boiling and melting points of metals. All right, I think that's pretty much really it in terms of, um, I guess, bonding that I wanted to explore. Um, if you have any questions about bonding, feel free to let me know. Um, the next thing that we're going to be looking at is naming. Naming is really important because there's a specific way to name things and that's called IUPAC naming. This is not only in inorganic, but also in organic, which you'll do in 11 and 12. Um, so naming um, covalent and ionic substances all come under IUPAC naming in terms of naming them. Um, the way you do it is you prefer the um, most metallic um, uh, element. So typically the metals are on the left hand side. So you do um, the metal that's probably on the left hand side um, written first, and then um, you start with a prefix. So you start with however many atoms there are, and then you end with IDE. Um, however, you only use this prefix if it's um, more than um, one. If it's just one, you don't use mono at the front typically, but that's only for the first um, element. So for example, if I want to name CO2, we all know it's carbon dioxide, but how it happens is that we look at which element is um, towards the left-hand side. So if I go back to um, the periodic table, just for the sake of explaining, Carbon is here, oxygen is here, therefore carbon is more on the left hand side, so we use carbon to name first, so therefore it will be carbon, not monocarbon, just carbon, um, and then since we have two oxygen atoms, it's di, and then ox for oxygen, and then ide, so dioxide. Um, if it was, I don't know, something like C2O2, I know it doesn't exist, but if it is C2O2, then it'll be um, dicarbon dioxide. That's how it works. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. So now that I've explained the first one, you guys can have a go at part B, C, and D. Um, let me just get up the question.
All right, um, we have carbon dioxide, and then we have phosphorus trifluoride and two or three CO. Yeah, that is correct. Um, more people are typing. Um, I'm just going to scroll down for the other answers. Try, no, it's not trifluorine, it's trifluoride. Um, because, um, remember, it needs to be IDE. So, yeah, I don't know if that was lip of the, um, typing, I guess. Um, but yeah, anyone else? N two O three is correct. CO is correct. The trifluoride there needs to be an E there. Um, but yeah, I think everyone's getting the same responses. I'm just gonna let anyone else who wants to finish typing in before um I move on. So all of these are correct, except this one. So it's phosphorus trifluoride um, because um, you have this at the front. And also it's not one word, it's phosphorus, and then you have a space, and then it's trifluoride. Um, just be aware of that. I don't think I made that clear, but yeah, it's actually two words. All right, um, I'm gonna stop that poll because I think everyone else is getting the correct answer. All right, let's move on. Um, the next one is pretty much naming um, ionic substances. So ionic substances, um, pretty much for cations, you need to have their elemental name. So if it's barium, it, it'll be barium, it won't change but the anion will change it would end with ide so let's say if it's um uh fluorine it will change to fluoride so yeah hopefully that makes sense um alrighty um so for the first one in this case na is the metal so therefore and it's a cation as well so therefore it'll just be sodium Cl minus is the anion, so therefore it'll change from chlorine to chloride, so therefore it'll be sodium chloride. That's how that works. Um, let me just get up um, the poll so you guys can finish off B, C, and D. Um, so far so good. Does anyone have any other answers?
Um, yep, that's good. Looks like everyone's getting the same thing. Um, so yeah, whoever wrote these answers are correct. Um, it's Casey for KCL. It'll be potassium, and then chlorine will change to chloride. Lithium um, has a plus one charge. Fluorine has a minus one charge, so plus one, minus one, and zero, so therefore it's LiF. And then for magnesium oxide, magnesium has a two plus charge, oxygen has a minus two charge, so plus two, minus two, and zero, so therefore it becomes MgO. So yeah, those are correct. Um, naming compounds with polyatomic ions can get a bit confusing, but really um, these are compounds that just have both ionic and covalent bonds. You name the cation first, followed by the anion, and you don't really have any prefixes unless it's already within the name. So something like dichromate um, um, over here is Cr2O7. That already has that in the name, so you don't need to change it, but no prefixes other than that. So for example, um, the first one's not really um, polyatomic, so I don't know why it's there, but if we look at the second one, um, it's K2SO3. Um, so firstly, you name the ionic part, sorry, not the ionic part, you firstly name the cation part, in this case it's potassium, so therefore it's just potassium, and then we look at what SO3 is. SO3 is um, sulfite, so therefore it'll be potassium sulfite. Now that I've explained part B, you guys can have a go at part C and D. Let me just get up the poll for that one. So have a go at these two. Um, all right, we're getting mixed answers. B is potassium sulfide. Hmm. Um, a lot of people are writing CCL, LIC. Um, all right, I'm going to stop it there. Um, I feel like maybe I haven't explained valencies as well. Um, um, so remember that groups have um, uh, different charges, so different valencies. So group one is plus one, group two is plus two, group three is plus three. Oh, why is this not working? So this is plus three. And then group four is plus or minus four. Um, group five is minus three. Group six is minus two. Group seven is minus one. Group eight is zero. So if we keep that in mind and we go back to this, um, if we have carbon chloride, right, 
um we have a minus four charge on carbon and then a minus one char actually no a plus four charge on carbon because carbon can be plus or minus four depending upon what it's attached with um so since it's attached with a non-metal which has negative it'll behave like a positive so a cation right so this will be plus four and chlorine is minus one remember that in a compound your overall charges need to be zero so if you just write ccl you have negative three not sorry not negative three you have positive three left right um so that's not exactly how it works so therefore you need to cancel out um the plus four charge on the carbon so therefore you'll have four, four chlorines being attached onto it so therefore it will become ccl4 um carbon is not neutral no i don't get where you're coming you're coming up with this no um so for something to be neutral that depends on ph so that's a whole nother concept um so i'm not sure what you're talking about um and then lithium carbonate is not exactly lic so if we look at it and also carbonate is not just c it's actually um co3 where is my carbonate ion on this? There we go, CO3 two minus. So this is actually a polyatomic ion. You just gotta know this by heart um, and memorize this. Um, since it has a two minus charge, and if we look at lithium, lithium has a plus one charge. I'll need two lithiums to cancel out this carbon. So plus two and minus two is zero. So therefore it'll be Li2CO3. That's how you write the formula. Hopefully that um, helps. Um, all right, I'm just going to close that tab. Um, moving on, sometimes you may also um, have compounds that contain oxy anions, and these are um, anions that pretty much contain oxygen, um, and you use the, pre the suffix ATE. So for something like sulfate, it's SO4, for nitrate, it's NO3, etc. Um, if you have, like, stemming off from this, right, where you have ATE, if you have one less oxygen, something like nitrate with NO3, if it becomes NO2, it becomes nitrite. So you change the suffix to ITE. For anions with more than one oxygen, then something like this. So, for example, for something like chlorate, um, it becomes per chlorate so you add a prefix of per um hopefully that makes sense the charges always stay the same by the way for all of these variations um you can see here that nitrate and nitrite have a negative charge per chlorate and chlorate also have a negative charge you don't need to understand why so don't worry about it um so yeah um and in terms of naming acids um naming it will depend on what um anion is present so if you have an anion that has chlor like an ide in it something like chloride then you name the um anion part as chloric and then you add hydro at the front so it becomes hydrochloric acid um for anions that end in h so ate um it pretty much changes itself to ic and it becomes sulfuric acid. For anions that end in ITE, um, such as hypochlorite, um, the ITE changes to OUS and it becomes hypochlorous acid. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's move on to um, questions. Not questions, sorry. Let's move on to depth studies and then I'll go on to um, questions. Alrighty, um, just a quick intro about what depth studies are. Depth studies are just like mini research tasks that you do. Though it doesn't seem mini, it is not relatively that, um, it shouldn't be that complex. Um, you do one depth study in your prelim year, another in your HSC year. Um, 
look the the way that the school is going to test is just going to really change but they're not going to make it um actually no i take that back they may make it outside of the syllabus because i've seen one school do it um but my school didn't do it outside of the syllabus so hopefully you guys are fine i did crystals by the way for anyone who wants to know i made crystals um which is not really covered in the syllabus, but yeah, it's a bit weird. Um, depth studies just relate to the working scientifically aspect of the syllabus. You may have seen it and, you know, whenever I see it, I just think of it as junk of the syllabus, but um, it's kind of important. So, um, yeah, if, if you find them confusing or difficult, um, you know, just because it's really absurd, there's no specific set way to do it. Um, just make sure you understand how it's like um, in year 11 because in year 12 um, it's going to be important. Um, sometimes the schools may let you choose a topic but just choose topics that are um, you know doable don't like choose something really niche um, and choose an experiment that's easy to easy to be controlled only has one independent variable you don't need multiple independent variables we don't do that in um year 11. generally this is what the structure of your report is going to be like so it's going to be with a title a name hypothesis um and inside your method you include things such as um you know measurements your variables the materials that you'll use you'll also have a separate section for risk assessment and then um, you also have things such as your results and your discussion. Discussion just pretty much explores the trend that has occurred, why it happens, um, looking at the different variables. So uh, things such as like validity, reliability, accuracy. And then finally you wrap it up with a conclusion that just pretty much um, tells whether you've not, whether or not you've served your aim. So it hasn't met your aim or not in essence. So yeah, and in terms of writing an aim or a hypothesis, the aim is pretty much what you're trying to figure out. So in an, in an example like this, it's pretty much whether or not salt water or pure water freezes at a faster rate. Um, and for hypothesis, it's pretty much linking um, one variable to another. So how, how the um, syllabus has kind of changed is that note this down by the way whoever um is watching this lecture you actually do need to provide a reason i don't know why it says do not um you do need to provide a reason to support your hypothesis um so it'll be something like linking one variable to another with with a reason so i'm just thinking of an example um something like Methane has a lower boiling point than water because methane only has dispersion forces, whereas water has all the different intermolecular forces and therefore has stronger intermolecular bonding. That's like a hypothesis you would um write. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, but yeah, you need to link one variable to another, follow up with the reason. Um, and in terms of variables, you just need to be explicit what your variables are. So you need to have one independent, one dependent, rest of the variables are controlled. So this is things such as volume of water, the temperature, the environment you're carrying it out in. Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, the type of salt you're using. So like salt can be like sodium chloride, but it can also be something like potassium chloride um so you know make sure it's the correct chemical formula and the same chemical formula things like that and also ensure that you state the um amounts that you're using as well for materials so the um you know substance that you're using followed by the um amount and also if it's like a beaker or like a pipette or measuring cylinder or whatever make sure you specify the volume it has risk assessment is a bit different for every school my school did like this online risk assessment thing whatever that is 
Um, but I remember we used to do it in um, uh, Brax, but I think for our assessments, we did like just like a normal risk assessment on paper. Um, we just explored what risks there are. So for example, you know, if you have, if you're using acid, obviously, you know, you might get burns, right? Or if you're using a heating plate, um, then, you know, you might get burns, um, things like that. Um, and you need to explore what the risk is, um, how it might cause harm, how can you prevent it, and how would you deal with it if they occur. These are the four points you need to explore. Um, and you also need to be doing results and discussions. So for results, it's typically just graphing it, um, you know, tabulating it using charts, whatever you want to do. Make sure everything is labeled with a figure. Um, so a figure label, so for example, figure one, um, maybe line graph showing different boiling points, something like that. Um, so that it's easy to refer in your discussion. Um, and discussion is typically the most difficult section. So you need to make sure that you um, refer, you, you need to ensure that it's concise and ensure that you're only referring to your experiments. So analyze your results. Do they support the hypothesis? Have you explored validity, reliability, and accuracy? You know, have you had any flaws within your method? And if you do have any flaws, how can you improve that next time? And how will that affect your validity, reliability, and accuracy? So it's really like analyzing your results, looking at your flaws, and looking at how you can improve them. Um, and conclusion pretty much just refers to your hypothesis really and aim as well. Um, it should not be more than one or two lines. So yeah, um, now really we can just pretty much go through any questions that you, you guys may have. Um, and I'll also just check if anyone else has any questions that are under review? Um, someone's asking, what is STP on slide 54? Um, let me double check for you, because I, I don't know. I know what STP is, I'm just thinking. Oh my God, I forgot. Oh crap, I forgot. Um, let me just think. I think it's standard, um, I don't know what the T stands for, but it's like standard atomic pressure or something. I forgot, I forgot, I will double check and let you know, because I, let me just look it up, because I honestly forgot having a mind blank. Um, oh yeah, standard temperature and pressure, that's what it means. Um, yeah, so that's what it is. What's a better way to get, what's a way to get better at SPDF notation? Um, really, it's just through practice. Um, yeah just do questions um and you'll get the hang of it and yeah i guess that's the only way that i can recommend i feel like a lot of like chemistry stuff is really just through um practice where'd you get tutoring for each subject i got private tutoring for all of them um bear in mind that i didn't do tutoring for every subject of mine i only did tutoring for like math english and science i didn't do it for french so the hydrogen bonding intermolecular side. <laughs> um, sure. So let me pull up the slide just so I know what I'm saying. Give me a sec. Mm, where is it? Yeah. So pretty much hydrogen bonds um only have 
they only occur when it's between a hydrogen atom and an oxygen, fluorine, and a nitrogen atom. That's it. Um, but yeah. Uh, does balancing? Yes, it does. Um, in fact, I think this is what you really start off with in year 11. Um, and they will always come up in year 12. In fact, even in like your exam, probably a mark is dedicated to a balanced chemical equation. And if you do long response or short response, ideally in every single question, you want to have a chemical equation. Could I go through ionic and covalent? Yes, I can. Give me one sec. Did she ask? Ionic network and covalent network. Okay, um, so ionic network is pretty much like a lattice, so like this. It has positive and negative um, ions just floating around, and it has strong electrostatic attractions, and as a result, it has really high melting and boiling points. Um, and because the electrons are shared, not shared, sorry, the electrons are given to one another, um, you don't have any free electrons floating around, so you can't conduct electricity. Covalent is a bit similar, except it only occurs between nonmetals, um, and it has continuous covalent bonding. Um, and because of that nature, it has high melting and boiling points. Also, cannot conduct electricity because they're all being shared between one another. There's no free floating electrons anywhere. So that's it. 